Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sarala, for um, the introduction. And thank you to the Sri Lankan army for this wonderful invitation. Um, this, uh, these few days have been uh, amazing. I woke up this morning and thinking, oh, I had a strange dream last night, a wonderful dream with wonderful dancers. And then suddenly, I, no, that was real. That were, it was all really there. And it's an amazing show you put on, the amazing hospitality. and the amazing friendship and comradeship of so many nations, but especially Sri Lanka, uh, all brought together at this amazing event. Um, so uh, I'm, um, I'm speaking on uh, public diplomacy. Let me see this. The, um, I think this uh, clicker isn't working, so I'll move to this. Uh, what I want to do in, in the time that I have is to uh, introduce the concept of public diplomacy because I think uh, for some of you it's a concept you won't be familiar with uh, and that will involve me setting out the components of public diplomacy. Um, then I want to explore some of the precedents for this kind of thinking in engaging extremism uh, through a look at uh, the history of counterinsurgency. Uh, I'll then um, look at how the approaches that we associate with public diplomacy have been applied in uh, existing counter-violent extremist strategy, uh, particularly looking at the case of the United States um, under President Obama, particularly. And then I want to try and articulate a multi-actor approach to CVE, which I think builds on the recommendations of Admiral Fallon yesterday and my conclusion in my conclusion I want to uh, maybe rethink uh, make my own contribution to the rethinking of CVE and the challenges that we have uh, ahead which I, I concur with previous speakers that this is complex um, but I think we can get some significant marching orders from analyzing uh, the nature of CVE, right, the nature of the challenge to CVE right now. So first of all, what is public diplomacy? Well, there's no mystery here to me. Uh, I see public diplomacy as being an extension of traditional diplomacy. And if traditionally diplomacy is an international actor's attempt to manage the world environment by engaging with a foreign actor, the sorts of things that foreign ministries do or that leaders do when they go to engage with other leaders. Uh, we understand what this, what this is. I see public diplomacy as being an extension of this same process. Public diplomacy is an actor's attempt to manage the international environment. It's a variety of diplomacy, but it has a particular set of tools tools that look to engage a foreign public. So traditional diplomacy would have a leader of Sri Lanka going to China, shaking hands in public, but what's really important happens in private. But public diplomacy would have the Chinese government coming to Sri Lanka, opening an educational institution, and working directly with uh, the people of Sri Lanka. The term public diplomacy is quite a new term. It's only 52 years old, but I think that we don't have to think that only things formally labeled public diplomacy are public diplomacy. My definition of public diplomacy would apply to anything that uh, follows this function of being an actor to public process. And when I look back through the history of international relations, I can see that there are at least five really important ways in which international actors have connected to foreign publics. And so I would say that this new term has five old practices and that we can look at those practices and learn something about how to address the issues facing us today. Of these five practices, one is of primary importance and has already been mentioned. Uh, it was mentioned by Major General Noble. It was mentioned by uh, uh, Philip Guski yesterday and by other speakers too. And that is the practice of listening. 
if we are going to communicate, we have to listen first. Now, it amazes me when I'm teaching in uh, foreign ministries and diplomatic academies that starting off by saying, listen before you communicate, comes as a surprise to people. But I think, don't these people have mothers? Has no one told them this before? Uh, but apparently, the further we get in life, the less we remember to listen. People tell us we already know what's important and we forget this uh, foundation. But when I look back through history, I'm struck that the very greatest diplomats, the very greatest public diplomats had a foundational skill in listening. The image on the screen is of the great American statesman and scientist Benjamin Franklin, who was the first American ambassador to go to France, the, the hegemon of its day, and he was beloved by the French. But the thing that most impressed French people about Benjamin Franklin was not that he was this great scientist, that he was this great statesman, that he could talk about any subject under the sun from cheese to kites. What impressed them was that he listened, that he was most interesting in learning what they had to say. And this profound compliment opened the gateway to real co communication, two-way communication between the United States of, uh, and the French people at that particular point. The second component of public diplomacy is advocacy going out and engaging with the public by explaining your policies. And this is something we all uh, do, all our governments understand this, they think about it, uh, and some governments have even conflated public diplomacy entirely with advocacy and the process of websites and Twitter feeds and press conferences and all that, that other stuff. Whilst I believe this is highly important, I, I feel that it's only the beginning of public diplomacy and the other components should not be neglected. Cultural diplomacy is significant. Reaching out by facilitating the export of culture. The image is a piece of uh, Soviet cultural diplomacy from the Cold War, exporting the Bolshoi Ballet. Exchange diplomacy, facilitating engagement between entire populations through educational exchanges, or um, uh, building uh, mechanisms for publics to get to know one another, such as the European Union's Erasmus Exchange. And finally, we have state-funded news, which uh, became highly significant once the electronic media were available to nations. You think about the achievement of, from my own country of origin, the BBC and its world service played such a role in uh, projecting Britain to the world, but also helping the world to understand itself during the um, uh, second uh, three quarters of the uh, 20th century. The United States invented this term public diplomacy as a useful tool during the Cold War. Why did they invent it? Well, to be honest, they wanted to have a term which was benevolent for international communication, which they could fill up with good democratic meanings. This would allow them to say those wicked communists do propaganda. The virtuous United States, the virtuous West does, does public diplomacy. Maybe to begin with, there wasn't so much of a difference. But subsequently, a ethical public diplomacy practice has emerged, which looks to two-way exchanges, which looks to listen and learn from foreign publics, and which is of value as we approach this problem of violent extremism. All of these elements of public diplomacy connect to the broader concept of soft power, which again a number of speakers have mentioned. This concept devised at the end of the 1980s by the Harvard political theorist Joseph Nye explains that the strength of a nation state comes not only from its ability to compel three people through military force or to motivate them through economic inducements, but also in the attractiveness of a country's values and culture. The connection to public diplomacy is obvious. Without mechanisms of communication, how does the world know about your values and culture? Without exchange, how does it experience your values and your culture? This brings me to the precedent 
I wanted to talk about. The public diplomacy dimension of uh, counterinsurgency operations. Now, just because the agencies I'm talking about here are military, it, I don't want to say that it wasn't public diplomacy they were doing, because in each instance, I could find uh, examples of these characteristic public diplomacy behaviors of good listening, good advocacy, good uh, cultural engagement. So effective counterinsurgency required that you listen to your adversary to isolate the enemy from their host population. You had to really understand who you were dealing with. You had to advocate to that host population for a better future to make sure that your vision of what they could be, of what their country could be, was stronger than the enemy's vision. You had to use culture and ensure that all behavior in that country fitted with local cultural values. Exchanges were used, working with host populations to build links and uh, two-way discussions around questions of development. And international broadcasting became essential, fighting with an eye to the outside world's perception of what you were doing in the combat zone. Now, an example where all of these boxes were ticked and military was effectively used would be the British campaign in what was then Malaya in the 1950s, led by uh, General Templer. The same things, uh, I think if we looked at that list, you could see how many of these things went wrong for various reasons during the United States engagement uh, in, in uh, Vietnam. Moving forward to our own time, we can see sound public diplomacy practices being used in counter-violent extremism, but sometimes things are missed, things go awry. The listening has been, I think, looking at the approach of the United States. Sometimes it's been too little and too late. I was really shocked by the uh, following 9-11, how few people in the uh, top end of the United States government were actually reading what Osama bin Laden was writing. And they were making um, declarations about what Osama bin Laden felt and believed that did not fit with the reality which was well known to the people he was uh, propagandizing to. Bin Laden himself commented on this. He said, it is so strange that George Bush thinks I hate freedom. If I hated freedom, I'd have declared war on Sweden. What I hate is not freedom, but, and then he gave his strategic narrative that he repeated over and over again, I hate crusaders in Islamic lands, I hate America's support for apostate regimes, and I hate the alliance between the United States and Israel. And those three things he repeated over and over again, and he was not addressed in a, for a long, it took a long time before the United States was attuning what it was doing and saying in the world, its narratives to these very simple uh, and often repeated narratives of, um, of bin Laden. Uh, where we see advocacy, well, there's been State Department advocacy around counter-violent extremism. I mean, the most recent example would have been the State Department's think again, turn away uh, interventions on uh, Twitter and elsewhere on social media. The problem here is that the State Department is not a credible voice in counter-violent extremism. The, as soon as the message is labeled as coming from the Department of State, the key audience is going, or the, 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 the target audience, the audience who have a potential to be radicalized, will be turned off. The challenge of public diplomacy today is not to think, what do I say to my target audience, as it might have been 20, 30 years ago. Today, the challenge is, who do I empower to deliver the message that I prefer to my target audience? And this requires a shift in the way we think about um, advocacy. In terms of culture, there have been some small but interesting cultural programs run by the United States government. 
uh, I was particularly interested to see the, an understanding of the power of music. And by the middle of the Bush administration, the administration had realized that if they wanted to engage young people in the Middle East, it would help to send musicians who were credible to them. And this might mean musicians who were themselves Muslim and who were themselves critical of the United States government, but still were representing something of American culture and values which might be attractive. The US government knew that the first thing that would happen would be that local religious authorities would object to these musicians coming to perform in a place like Egypt, and that the second thing that would happen would be that young people would decide they wanted to go to hear them to be exposed to uh, that message. And this has worked in a small scale. Exchange schemes have also been, uh, it's been interesting to see that they've targeted youth, they've targeted women, and have especially looked to give uh, groups of women and younger people exposure to American technology, which is well understood as being part of American, an important part of America's soft power today. Uh, the United States attempted a lot of international broadcasting to the region, uh, and there's not so much evidence that this has been uh, successful. But looking at the um, behavior of the United States up to this point, one thing that frustrates me is the way in which good uh, approaches are skewed by domestic politics. So often, the priority is not to engage an extremist audience or to uh, interrupt uh, an, a radicalization process. But rather, the objective is to be seen to be coping with the problem, to reassure the domestic audience that the president is in charge, that the um, uh, authorities are competent, and that Americans don't have to worry about this problem, that it's coming under control and that there are smart people who are working effectively to deal with it. And sometimes this political um, dynamic has led to the exposure and the interruption and even the negation of an important program. I said to you how I think that the need is to find the right person to empower. An example of this process of empowerment was the way in which uh, some uh, allied governments and uh, the corporate um, uh, media giant Google found a young um, Islamic communicator who worked, uh, his, he, his um, uh, online name was Abdullah X. And his slogan was, uh, heart of a warrior, mind of a scholar. And this is an image of him on the screen. And what he would do is he'd make these uh, little videos about his own transition from being a radical to being a skeptical uh, Muslim, looking for other solutions, more complex solutions to the problems of his generation. Now, he had tremendous credibility. And then the US government started saying, aren't we smart? We're using, we're working with this person to improve uh, our uh, chances of Violent ex of combating violent extremism, and of course it undercuts that, uh, that work in, a, a f I think, a, a, a very frustrating way. And I know people who were, had put a lot of energy into the Abdullah X project were very um, annoyed that it became common currency and was so undermined. Better, I think, is the multi-actor approach. This is the kind of collective cure that Admiral Fallon was suggesting yesterday. We can see today how some of the most effective work countering violent uh, extremism is done by unifying uh, countries in their media work through a, uh, an, a, 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 a cooperative hub, a media hub, making sure that within one's own government there's a consistent message and between uh, different countries too there's a consistent message collective listening so that we're pooling what we learn about the vulnerable communities uh, and knowing our audience collectively. Understanding this important process of recruitment, 
and radicalization. I thought it was very important what Philip said yesterday about nobody self-radicalizing, because that means that in every radical, violent, extremist life, there's a, a point of communication where an intervention is possible. That gave, gave me tremendous hope. Thinking about the problem in terms of a challenge of empowerment, not a challenge of writing the right magical monologue. You know, this is not Harry Potter, where one spell and the wave of a magic wand will somehow fix violent extremism, but maybe helping others to speak to their own communities about violent extremism might do the trick. And sometimes so that means creating and translating messages that they can pass on to their own community as memes. And this is be, has been done quite effectively, recognizing the need on social media to have material that can be used as a currency. I've been impressed by the creation of networks uh, to affirm best practice and provide platforms where people can discuss what's working. Uh, there's a strong cities network that's been sponsored by the State Department, and the European Union has its, um, its RAN, its Radicalization Awareness Network that Michael Jones talked a little bit about yesterday. But the final point is we, shouldn't, we should make sure that when we do use hard power, our hard power interventions don't uh, make matters worse. And sometimes the hard power grandstanding, the use of a particular kind of weapon uh, in a clumsy way can make the process of de-radicalization harder, can make the process of interrupting, with, uh, interrupting violent extremism harder and can play into the, uh, the rhetoric of recruiters. In conclusion, I want to leave you with some broader thoughts about how we should rethink this process of counter-violent extremism. I'm struck by this question. What if violent extremism is not a disease, but a symptom of something broader? Our energy that we spend on countering violent extremism, it may be important, but what if we're missing an underlying problem? What if the real issue is a climate of nihilism in the world and the absence of of a collective vision of a future in which we can all believe. What if the drivers of violent extremism and the drivers of other kinds of political problems right now turn out to be the same? When I look around the world, I see not only violent extremism, but I also see many countries that are experiencing a new nationalism, a kind of populism, and are falling back on a romantic vision of a, their own past that, that never was, and on a turning to individual strong men to provide the solution. We see many countries in the world where there are calls to make the country great again, build the wall, and so forth. This is not a problem with, a, with one particular country, but we can find many, many parallels for uh, this kind of rhetoric and thinking. When I try and explain to myself why countries are making the choices and turning towards this kind of new nationalism politics, quite often a component of the new nationalism is a victim narrative. In my own country of origin, Great Britain, the shock last year of Brexit was driven often by a strange narrative that had really taken hold of British people that Britain had somehow suffered in the world and that it was time for Britain to uh, correct uh, its uh, condition. And so many countries, so many populations have a victim narrative underpinning not just violent extremist behavior, but also other kinds of uh, inward-looking, uh, cooperation-resistant uh, antagonistic politics. You can think yourselves of um, uh, international difficulties, maybe which your own country is party to, where there is a problem of a victim narrative, or even where there are interlocking and 
contradictory victim narratives on both sides of the situation. So I think that not only should we be thinking about how do we counter violent extremism, but how do we counter the victim narrative which is driving both counter violent extremism and driving so much of this turn to a regressive, nationalistic, uncooperative, anti-global politics. You might answer, just to finish off, I've got this one last thought. Why you are thinking, has he got a picture of somebody walking between the two towers on a tightrope? And I know those twin towers are some sort of symbol of this moment of violent extremism because of 9-11. But the reason the two towers are there is because of this incident that happened in the 1970s where a tightrope walker walked between them. There was a wonderful film called The Walk which talked about that tightrope. The way that the tightrope works is that in order to walk a tightrope, you keep your eye on the end of the wire. Watch the end of the wire, and that's where your stability comes from, from the forward vision. You can move forward if you do that. If you're not watching the end of the wire, you have two options. If you look down, you wobble. The only other alternative is you look back. And so many countries right now have a politics that involves looking backwards to an idealized view of the past. Too few are looking forwards. So to me, the solution to so many of these problems is to have a vision that we can all buy into that is attractive. And this is what has solved the great existential crises of the past. The First World War was resolved, I know, temporarily, but when people were brought into a vision from Woodrow Wilson, a narrative, if you wish, of a League of Nations. That vision was so attractive that not only the allies bought into it, but the enemy bought into it too, for a time. The crisis of the Second World War was resolved when Franklin Roosevelt and his allies articulated a vision of the United Nations. People could buy into that, not only the allies, but also the enemies, also the neutrals, and something could be built. Similarly, in our own time, we had visions that people could buy into. Today, we're lacking those visions. So one of our questions should be, where, who can give us a narrative that can link what we're doing together and effectively bring us together so that we can move to our stable, prosperous, collective, secure future. I apologize for taking a little extra time. Uh, thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to a discussion of these important issues. Thank you very much.